Thanks, Jesse. All right, so welcome to the UVM Extension New Farmer Project webinar, Practical Food Safety for Produce Farms. Our presenters this afternoon are Ginger Nickerson, Good Agricultural Practices Outreach Coordinator at UVM Center for Sustainable Agriculture, and Hans Estrin, uh, UVM Extension Farm to School Coordinator. Um, welcome, Ginger and Hans. We're psyched to have you here today and uh, hear what you have to share with us. Thanks, Jesse. Great. Thank you, Jesse. And I just want to add that we're also going to be joined by Londa Nwadike, who is UVM Extension's food safety faculty. She'll be sitting in on the talk, and she'll be available at the end if people have questions specifically about food safety as it relates to processing value-added foods, meat, or maple syrup. So. Um, to get started, I have to say I'm kind of surprised that how many people decided to give up a sunny afternoon to learn about food safety. But I guess that's a good thing. Can everybody hear me OK? OK. Um, well, I guess Jesse will deal with it if, if folks have problems hearing me. So what we're going to cover today is um, briefly talking about why there's so much attention being paid to foodborne illnesses in fresh produce now and why you should be caring about food safety as a fruit or vegetable grower. Um, will the Food Safety Modernization Act affect you as a grower? Do you need to be GAP certified? And then the bulk of the presentation is going to be focusing on food safety issues that you'll want to consider as you're planning your farm. And then Hans is going to address some special considerations for food safety from farm to institution sales, so if you're selling to schools or hospitals. Then we'll have a couple slides that you can refer to with um, information about helpful resources, and hopefully there'll be time for some questions and answers at the end. So this presentation is really intended just to be an overview of practical food safety issues. We're not going to be getting into details a lot, but um, Hans is actually going to be offering two classes in March, in early March, one in Brattleboro and one in Berlin, where he'll be providing much more detailed information about this. And I'll share information about those workshops at the end of the webinar. And can I add, Ginger, just a, a, intro, a request here that all the participants, uh, if you could just in the chat box write uh, whether you're a farmer or service provider or whatnot and where you're from, that would be helpful. Um, for us as presenters and knowing who's out there. Hi, thanks, Hans. It, this is Jesse. Why don't we go ahead, if everyone can see under the list of names, there's a green check and a red X. Um, if you are a farmer, go ahead and hit the green check right now. Um, All right, so we have a few farmers, uh, a few more farmers. <laughs> uh, and then the rest of you who didn't answer, I'm going to take a guess. Uh, hit a green check if you're a service provider. Hmm. Wanda. <laughs> if you don't know where those green checks or X's are, look under the list of names on the right. Um, and you'll see, uh, well, we have some people here here, and they're not telling us why they're here, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> you guys can continue. <laughs> Thanks. It, the, wow, the, um, Colorado. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's great. The, the text coming in is very helpful. OK, well, this is, this is going to be interesting. So um, in part, because I have to remember to forward the slides. OK, so how come there is so much attention being paid to uh, food safety as it relates to fresh produce 
these days. And um, the main reason is that since the 1990s, we've started seeing many more outbreaks of foodborne illnesses associated with fresh produce. And that's meant that there's a lot more increased public attention to produce safety. And what's been causing the increase in these outbreaks of foodborne illnesses in fresh produce is a combination of changes in the food system and changes in consumer behavior and trends in public health. So on one hand, we have new technologies and systems for delivering fresh produce that we didn't have in the past. So if you think about going to the grocery store and all of the bags of pre-cut and bagged produce those are creating a nice environment for microbes, um, including some microbes that aren't very friendly. And then in addition, as the industrialized food system has become a lot more centralized, um, centralized production and distribution systems mean that when there's contamination at one site, such as there was in 2006 with the bagged spinach that was contaminated with E. coli, that can affect consumers of a really wide geographic area. So you can start seeing you know, hundreds of people impacted and that will pop up on the CDC's radar. The other issue that's going on is that um, there are some changes in terms of, of uh, consumer behavior and public health. So we have a lot more people now eating raw or uncooked fresh produce. So you know, lots of salad bars um, out there and um, fast food places that might not have been present before. And um, but we also have a lot more people who are living longer with compromised immune systems, and that can include people with diabetes, people with cancer, people with kidney disease, elderly folks, even um, pregnant women. So, and then finally, some pathogens have been evolving into more virulent forms, and that's why we hear often about E. coli 0157H7. Uh, <laughs> is that you, Hans? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a really bad circle. <laughs> I won't do it anymore. Uh, because uh, that that particular strain of E. coli uh, can can cause some pretty serious illnesses. Um, so, although the dairy and meat producers have had to follow food safety regulations for decades, until recently, fruit and vegetable growers really have been pretty um, unregulated in terms of, of uh, produce safety for, for fresh whole produce. And but because of these recent increases in foodborne illnesses in fresh produce, the, the Food and Drug Administration, the US Department of Agriculture, food buyers and consumer advocacy groups have pushed for the passage of the Food Safety Modernization Act, which the President just signed into law in January. So um, if you have specific questions about the Food Safety Modernization Act, I'd like to hold off on them and address them at the end of the webinar. But for now, I'm just going to say that most of you will probably not be directly affected by the Food Safety Modernization Act as growers unless you're making over $500,000 in gross sales either through wholesale or direct marketing. If you're making under 500000 in um, gross sales, you are still subject to local and state regulations as they pertain to food safety um, as a produce grower. And most of those have to do with, at this point, have to do with water quality and manure and compost management. So, um, Depending on what markets you want to sell your produce to, you're much more likely to be affected by gaps or good agricultural practices than by the Food Safety Modernization Act. And gaps were developed by the FDA and the USDA in 1998 based on those organizations' guidelines to minimize microbial food safety hazards for fresh cut fruits and vegetables. And good agricultural practices have much in common with the practical food safety practices that we're going to be discussing today. 
you basically you develop a farm plan, you implement the best practices for food safety that are possible for your farm. And the primary difference between what we're going to be talking about today and becoming GAP certified is that if you're going for GAP certification, an auditor, either through the USDA or a private company, will come onto your farm, conduct an audit to certify that you're following the practices in your farm plan, and then once you've passed, your farm is listed on the USDA website as being GAP certified. So the process is very similar to the organic certification program, um, and there's actually some of the standards between organic certification and GAP certification. There's, there's overlap between the two of them. But you have to pay, if you want to be GAP certified, you have to pay to be audited for every year that you want to maintain your certification. Um, so GAPS started out as a voluntary program, but what's happened is that after um, so the early mid-2000s, a number of large buyers, especially large supermarkets, started saying that they would only purchase from growers if those growers had GAP certification. So in Vermont today, the main buyers who are requiring GAPs are Hannaford's, Price Chopper, and Albert's Organics. And just out of um, curiosity, can you p put one of those little green checks or if, if you're considering selling to any of those three markets? Okay, so I'm going to go on in case at the moment it doesn't look like anyone's thinking of selling to them, uh, which is sort of what I was expecting from um, an audience of new and beginning growers. So this presentation, it's not going to be focused on gaps. Um, because unless you wanted to sell to one of those markets, it's not going to apply to you. So for that reason, we decided to focus on just on food safety practices in general as they apply to fruit and vegetable growing. But in the future, if you are interested in GAPS, please contact me, and I'm happy to work with anybody one-on-one. -on -one. Ginger, can I insert uh, to that when it says a food safety plan, everyone else, I think the uh, Ginger's going to address this as well, but um, you know, if you're growing food and selling it, you're a food grower, you're a professional food grower in some capacity, and uh, really GAP, Good Agricultural Practices, is what is happening currently in this profession, and so as a professional, just kind of being up to speed, writing a food safety plan doesn't take a lot of time, and it really is prudent to be educated uh, and educate yourself on, on on what the concerns are and what's going on from a food safety perspective. That's it. Thanks, Hans. Yeah, and there, there's actually a number of places where having thinking about your farm from the perspective of food safety can also bring other wins to your operation. So for example, if you're adding a disinfectant to your wash water, in addition to decreasing microbial pathogens that might cause foodborne illnesses, it's also going to decrease molds and fungi on your product. So that, in turn, can increase the shelf life of your product and have you, you know, have a better quality product that's staying, um, that's looking better in, in the market for a longer period of time. Going through your farm and thinking about how you can be cleaner and more organized can increase the efficiency of your operation. Um, having a written food safety plan will also provide you with a document that you can share to any buyers or consumers that are concerned about food safety issues. And um, Hans is going to talk to us uh, towards the end of the presentation more about what this means in terms of schools and hospitals because of the populations that they work with. They are particularly interested in farms having food safety plans. So if you're interested in selling to schools and hospitals, having one can uh, potentially expand your market opportunities. And um, just two other points. One, hopefully thinking about food safety reinforces your values for a high quality product. Um, a lot of people when they're thinking 
about food and, and what kind of food they want to produce and the qualities they want to associate it with it. They don't necessarily think consciously about food safety because it's just sort of an assumption that we all have that the food we're producing is going to be safe. But it's important to, particularly in terms of if you're serving someone who might have a compromised immune system, to be aware of um, you know, that nobody wants to make their customers sick. So just to keep that in mind. Um, and then finally, if heaven forbid, and hopefully this won't ever happen, if there is the case of an outbreak of a foodborne illness in Vermont that's, that can be connected with the produce farm, if you have good records and have a food safety plan that you're following, in the case of an investigation, it can help um, protect your business. So basically, whether people are interested in going for GAP certification or not, um, as ag service providers, we're recommending that everybody should be thinking about having some kind of a written food safety plan for their operations. So um, what are the kinds of contaminants that we're talking about when we're talking about food safety and fresh produce? So some of them you're probably already thinking about. So potential chemical contaminants. You're keeping your pesticides and any toxins separate from where you're handling food. When you're bringing your food to market, you're being aware of any physical contaminants. You're taking out any stones or pieces of wood that might be in there with the produce. What people are less likely to think about are the contaminants that we can't see, so the bacteria, viruses, parasites, those um, invisible contaminants. The most common foodborne illnesses that are associated with fresh produce, the, the pathogens that are the most common are Campylobacter, Salmonella, and E. coli. And um, these three categories or families of organisms are found in the intestines of birds and mammals. So the feces from those birds and mammals get into soil and water, and then produce can be contaminated through contact, either direct contact with the bird and animal feces in the fields, or through contact with the soil or water that has those feces in them. And salmonella, in addition, is, is um, commonly spread through improper hand washing by people who are handling food. So um, when you're thinking about food safety on your farm, you want to be thinking about all the potential points of contact where either soil, animal or human feces, or water could be coming in contact with food or with food contact surfaces or with water contact surfaces, such as um, countertops and packing containers. So now we're going to start just thinking about how you might be approaching this on your farm. And I always like to recommend that people should start by thinking about their vision or their mission statement for your, their farm and think about your values and what are the values you have for the food that you're producing and the values you have for your customers. And so you might be thinking, well, you know, I want to produce really fresh food and, and get it to market quickly. I want to be producing food that, that just tastes amazing and that looks beautiful. And I would just encourage you to add um, thinking about caring about your customer's health and making sure that the food that you're sharing with them is as safe for their health as it possibly can be. So um, there are six basic steps to addressing food safety issues on your farm. And as I just mentioned, you might want to start by thinking about your mission or your vision statement for your farm and, and thinking about how food safety fits in and writing that in and using that as sort of your, um, your guiding light for some of the less exciting parts of um, implementing a food safety plan. The next thing that's going to happen is you're going to take a tour of your operation and assess the different risks um, on your farm. Uh, if you have a map of your farm, you can actually you know, physically note on the map, locate where any of those risks are. 
and then you'll have that to refer to as you're thinking about farm planning. And then once you've identified the risks, you want to address them, mitigate them as much as you possibly can. And I should say that, you know, you're never going to be able to eliminate the risks of microbial contamination on a farm. I mean, these are organic living systems and they can't, you know, we can't, um, uh, we're always going to be surrounded by microbes. Um, so the best that we can do is reduce the risks. Then um, you, I, it would be great if you could think about some of the standard practices or operating procedures that you do on a regular basis and write those down and include them in your food safety plan. And then finally, educate others. Once you've identified what your practices and your policies are going to be around food safety on your farm, you'll want to educate others about those practices. So in, what's particularly helpful is if you have other workers on your farm or visitors having signage to let them know um, what, your, what your practices are. Okay, so um, now we're going to start talking about um, specific areas as they relate to produce growing and where some food safety risks might occur. And Hans found this uh, incredible Dora the Explorer food safety roadmap uh, that's this, going to yeah, this help is us. A, it's an online game, and actually, I went to try to look at the actual game about a half hour ago, and um, apparently it's, it's uh, been discontinued, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, for those, any of you who have kids and know Dora, um, Dora is this insanely um, kind of, uh, I, w I should say, simplistic road maps of like, you know, first we go to the bridge, then we do this, and there's always like three goals, and then they have to get to the goals, and it's all so clear, it just puts you right to sleep. <laughs> um, so it's the but what, what's absolutely astounding about this is if you want to go back after we've gone through the rest of the presentation, you'll see that the things that they've highlighted on this map are the very things that produce growers should be identifying. So how Dora got involved in this <laughs> world, I don't know, but it's um, pretty interesting. So anyhow, um, off, of, off of Dora. So we're going to first look at um, risks associated with cultivation, then talk about har some steps you can take in terms of harvesting, washing and cooling, packing and storing of produce, transporting. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about setting up tracking systems, and then uh, farmer health and hygiene, and uh, not so much costs as thinking about addressing any costs in a phased way. Because if you're just starting out, um, you might not want to make a lot of investments right up at the front end, but if you can keep your eye on things that um, you might eventually want to be working towards, then you can kind of develop a, a, a long-term plan for food safety on your farm. So, um, cultivation. So your farm food safety plan could begin with an assessment of the land itself. And thinking the things that you're going to want to think about are how long has the land been in agriculture? Was it used for something else before you started farming there? And if it was, uh, were those activities activities that might have um, attendant you know, contamination with them. Uh, so for example, uh, was there a dump site in old car batteries or old cattle carcasses? Uh, you might, if you're um, in bottomlands, does flooding occur? If so, how often? And you're also going to be thinking about where different sources of potential contamination are located in relation to your crop production areas. So um, if you have manure piles or compost piles, you 
whenever possible, it's ideal to have them located upslope from, I mean downslope, sorry, from your crop production area so if there's uh, any leaching or runoff, it won't be running into your crop production areas. If that's not possible, then you can um, try to mediate any runoff or leaching by building some dirt berms and um, adding buffer strips or hedgerows between the manure or compost pile and your crops. Similarly, you want to think about where you're locating animals. So um, you can see from this picture these folks have some chicken tractors and hopefully you can see in the picture that they're sort of in a swale so if there is any um, runoff or, or leaching, it's not going to go uphill onto the crops, but it's going to stay down in that, that swale. Also, if, you're, um, if you are grazing livestock or applying raw manure, you want to make sure that there's a minimum of 120 days between when raw manure is applied and when crops are being harvested. And that's if you're, if any of you guys are organic certified, um, that's true for all crops, whether they are above ground or below ground. The 120 days is sort of the, the standard, at least for, for gaps. Um, and then again, um, you can use berms and buffer strips to try to protect crops from, from runoff from any livestock areas. Another issue that you're going to want to be concerned with and thinking about are, is compost production. So um, you want to make sure that your compost is being heated to at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit for at least three days and turning it at least twice. The best practice would be to keep records of your compost and that's good not just in terms of a food safety perspective and making sure that, that um, you're handling it properly but also it's going to help you in terms of identifying what the right recipe is to use and making the best quality compost for your operation. And uh, you also want to keep an eye on any other critters that might be recontaminating your compost piles with, with uh, fresh manure. <laughs> Thank you, Hans. <laughs> um, so another thing that you're going to want to be attentive to is testing all of your water sources so that you can identify if there are any potential sources of contamination in either the water that you're using for, for your own drinking or hand washing or for processing the produce or for irrigation. And um, the state standards for drinking hand washing and processing water are that they have to be potable, which means that you need to have um, both the total coliform levels and the E. coli levels need to be zero. And um, if you're drawing your water from a municipal source, then you can just get the test results from the town. And I, I think that's usually free. Uh, if you're drawing your water from either a well or from surface waters, then those you need to take the test yourself and then send it into either a private lab or the state health department. The state health department um, is less expensive than private labs, but it's a slower turnaround time. Uh, if it turns out that your well Num the numbers on your water tests for a well are coming up high. You're going to want to, you know, maybe open up that well, look at the casing, see if it's cracked, see if some dirt might be getting in that way, or if um, a little critter fell in and passed away. There are also resources if you if you continue and. Um, you know, once you've addressed whatever issues there might be, if you continue getting high levels for wells, there are folks at the Agency of Agriculture who can help you um, figure out how to mitigate any issues that you might have with a well. 
And I won't get into into that. If somebody has problems uh, with with well water, contact me or contact the Agency of Agriculture. So for irrigation water, um, the state has recommended standards of 200 colony forming units for total coliform and 77 colony forming units for E. coli. And it's very possible that your levels, if you're drawing your irrigation water from either an irrigation pond or a river, it's really possible that, that those levels might be higher for your water tests. And um, there's a few ways to deal with that. One of the first things that you want to make sure of is that when you drew the sample that you were drawing it properly. So make sure that you're testing the water on a low flow day. You don't want to do it immediately after a rainstorm when all kinds of muck and detritus is going to be floating there. You want to take the samples from the end of the hose or the tap or nozzle uh, where the water is coming out of and not from the body of water itself. And if the numbers are continue to be high, it it might be that there was um, you know, a Canada goose or something that just flew over. So try testing again. Um, there are ways, if you, if you do have high levels, and that wouldn't be surprising because you know, E. coli is just found in the soil. So uh, and water often, you know, surface waters tend to have soil in them. Think about uh, how you might address that or mitigate it through your irrigation methods. So if you have to use overhead irrigation, whenever possible try to maximize the drying days between when you're doing the overhead irrigating and when you're harvesting. You can also consider switching to furrow irrigation uh, or if you can afford it, drip. So another thing that you're want, going to want to be thinking about is um, minimizing animal incursion in your, your crop production areas. So this is one of those win-win areas where if you're doing something to prevent microbial contamination from animal feces, hopefully it's also helping you reduce your crop predation um, and crop loss. From, from wildlife. So there's a bunch of different things that you can do to keep animals out of crops. Probably most of you are pretty familiar with them. You can trap. You can get permission from the local game warden to hunt out of season. You, there are lots of scare devices out there that you can use, such as flash tape or scare balloons. Um, I've talked with some farmers who've had really good luck with double strand deer fences. It's, it's two strands of electric fencing that are maybe set two feet apart. And you can bait one of those um, lines of fence with peanut butter in the springtime. And then when the does get zapped, they will teach their, they'll train the fawns not to go near the fence. So I've, I've spoken with some farmers who've had some really good luck with that. In addition, you also want to make sure that you're locating any trash or cull piles at a distance from your packing and storage areas so that you're not drawing pests towards the areas where you're handling food. And you want to make sure that you're keeping brush and weeds near your production packing and storage areas mowed um, as much as possible to reduce habit for rodents. I know one farmer who's practically eliminated his problems with voles and mice just by keeping all of his non-production areas, especially around his pack house and his greenhouse, really carefully mowed. So moving on to field harvesting, um, you know, again, thinking about points of contamination where the product is going to be touching soil or, or other food contact surfaces. So think about your harvesting containers and your tools because they're, they're going to get dirt on them. And excuse me. 
So whenever possible, you want to think about using harvest containers that you can wash and sanitize on an as-needed basis. And um, this picture in the middle is of a farm that has purchased some U-line uh, recycled plastic bins that come in different colors. And so what they've done is they have color coded their harvest containers by the different types of crops. So you might have, you know, uh, blue for your leafy greens and um, red for root crops. And then another thing you might want to think about is sanitizing your harvesting tools. And you can just dip them in a chlorine solution at the end of the day and uh, rinse those off. So then um, thinking about your washing and cooling stations, the goal is you want your wash water to be as clean, that is having as few microbial pathogens in it as possible. And because soil naturally carries E. coli, listeria, and other pathogens, you want to be changing your wash water fairly frequently. So the best practice, as you can see in the image on the left, is to use either a um, two or three wash tanks so that you can rinse the product off in a few different um, times. You, know, you start it in one and then you move it to the next and then if you have a triple wash you move it to the third. It's also a good practice to add disin some kind of disinfectant to your wash water, especially if you're only doing a single wash. And you can, um, one thing you can do is to add chlorine and approximately seven teaspoons per five gallons of water will get you to 100 to 150 parts per million of chlorine. If your um, organic certified chlorine has to be diluted to four parts per million before it's dumped out. So if that is a little bit trickier for organic growers to use chlorine as a disinfectant. So many organic growers use either food grade hydrogen peroxide or per acetic acid as their disinfectants. Um, Whichever disinfectant you use, you want to make sure that you're monitoring the pH so that it at the appropriate level, and it's usually between 6 and 7, or 6.5 and 7.5. And even if you're using a double or triple wash, you want to be making sure that you're changing the wash water in between crops. And if you're only using one wash, um, you want to make sure that you're really staying on top of, of uh, changing your wash water pretty frequently. And you want to be most attentive, obviously, to washing crops that customers might not be washing themselves before they eat them, such as leafy greens. Okay, so the next thing you're going to want to be thinking about and looking at are your packing and storage areas. And as we all know, um, Barns can be a great opportunity for chemical or physical contaminants, so you want to make sure that um, anything that's coming in contact with your product is stored separately and, and protected from other contaminants. So here on the far left is someone who's created a, a he just built a bin to store his packing containers in. The picture in the middle is someone who they've taken all of their packing containers and have put it up on a pallet and covered that with a tarp to make sure that that's not getting contaminated. And then obviously you're, where there's food, you're going to have rodents. So um, you'll probably want to think about some kind of a systematic rodent control program. So storage, um, after you wash and cool your product, you want to make sure that you're going to keep it covered and cool as possible until sale or shipping. You're going to want to minimize the storage time between harvest and sale. So uh, it's great if you can try to sell any perishable produce within 72 hours of harvesting it. And the best practice would be to store it 
at 30 to 45 degrees after harvest or any post-harvest handling, you know, any washing or cooling that you do. If you can't afford a walk-in cooler, which a lot of beginning farmers can't, one thing that you might want to explore is um, the image in the right-hand corner is of a cool bot, and that's an instrument that can regulate the temperature of of an air conditioner. So you can build um, a, and insulate a cooler yourself and then get one of these cool bots and it will make sure that the air conditioner maintains the appropriate temperature that you, that you want to keep your produce at. And then finally, you just want to make sure that if you do have a, a cooler with, um, that none of the condensation from it is going to be dripping on your produce. So transportation, you want to keep your transport vehicles as clean as possible when you're transporting produce in them because that's another food contact surface. The best practice is to not carry non-food items in your transportation vehicle, but obviously that's not going to be practical for a lot of beginning farmers. So if you do have to carry non-food items in your, in your truck, you want to make sure that you're going to use a tarp. Lay the tarp down first to protect all your surfaces. And then after you've transported your manure, compost, livestock, or chemicals, that you really give that your, your vehicle a very thorough cleaning and, and sanitize it as much as possible. Um, OK, so tracking. <laughs> So one of the foundations of the Food Safety Modernization Act is developing a national trace pack system so that whenever there's an outbreak of a foodborne illness, the FDA and stores will be able to recall the product and have a mechanism for identifying where the contamination began. So what this means for, for growers is that there's going to be a lot of emphasis on labeling where produce comes from and for each actor or step in the food chain to be able to trace produce one step back or where it came from and one step forward where it is going to. So in, if you're a grower, in your case, you're going to be able to um, it would be beneficial if you can trace the product back to what field it was coming out of and trace forward to whatever buyer you're selling it to. And um, I'm introducing it now because even though this is not for people who are going for GAP certification, it's just for folks who are thinking about practical food safety on their farms. I want to just have you be aware of it because buyers are going to be increasingly asking you um, what your traceback system is. And also, as I had mentioned earlier, if there is an outbreak in Vermont, then having traceback records can help protect your business in the, the instance of either a recall or an investigation. So um, there are some buyers like Black River Produce even though they're not requiring gaps, they are asking for some traceback um, practices to be implemented for people who are selling to them now. And what they're looking for is to have growers label their packing cartons with the name and location of the farm and then some kind of a pack date or if you don't want to put the date that your produce was packed, having some sort of a code that you can then um, identify when it was packed. And you know, you don't have to invest in fancy schmancy labels. You can just run off your own very simple labels with your farm name and location that you run off on address labels from your own home computer and printer. Um, one farmer that I know uses the mailing labels that the Cancer Society sends him, and he just slaps those on his packing cartons. And then you can either hand write the pack date on the carton with a marker, or you could buy a labeling gun. And that's a, a picture of just a, a labeling gun that where they, they have, um, you can buy versions with up to, I think, 12 spaces for digits. So you can come up with some really fancy codes if you're so inclined. 
So um, just briefly, if you are interested in GAPS certification, GAPS requires documentation of pretty much everything. If you don't have a record of it, it doesn't happen. But for just the purposes for um, folks listening today, if you're not interested in GAP certification, but you just want to be thinking about, you know, what's the minimal amount of record keeping to keep track of um, food safety practices on my farm, what I would recommend are keeping records of any water tests that you do, keeping records of the dates that you're applying raw manure or when you're rotating your animals that might be grazing and so that you can make sure that you have that 120 day gap in between the application of raw manure and when product is harvested. Keep um, records of the temperature of your compost and when you're turning it. And I think it's also interesting to keep records of um, rodent or pest control events because that can help you learn about animal behavior and modify whatever pest control strategies you're, you're using. And then finally, uh, keeping your harvest or packing logs, um, your records of what product went to which buyers when can help you um, with trace back if that's ever necessary. I'd like to add there too that um, invoices, almost, well most people write invoices, but invoices are a great uh, way to log um, packing harvest who went where when. I know there are definitely some farmers in Wyndham County who are using the invoice to, uh, with in parentheses, and buy an item to put the pack date and uh, the field it came out of. So you can do a lot of stuff with those. Great. Thanks, Hans. So I saved what's actually probably the most important practice. If, uh oh, I think I spelled hygiene wrong. Um, if you don't take anything else away from this presentation, this is the one thing that I want you to take back. Um, I, I tell people that my job is telling people to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. So, um, you know, just I cannot emphasize enough how important washing your hands is before you touch produce and after you do anything else. So um, if you are leasing a site and you're um, not close to a bathroom, you don't have a bathroom where your fields are, try to come up with um, another way to address that situation. You know, if you have to drive to, to use a bathroom um, and or establish some kind of a hand washing station in the field and this picture in the, the bottom right hand corner, I hope you can see that is um, it's called a tippy tap and it was actually developed it was a resource that Londa shared with us. Uh, Londa used to work in Africa and tippy taps were developed in, in developing nations to help people design hand washing stations that they could just have in the field under really rudimentary conditions and uh, you know this is just like a gallon jug with there's a string attached to that pedal so that you can then have running water in the field and you can google tippy taps and find instructions for how to make those but then that will um, provide you with a way to wash your hands with running water and the other issue is um, that you always want to have soap and the soap and washing your hands for t a minimum of 20 seconds, saying twinkle twinkle little star, is actually much more important than the temperature of the water. So it's really about being using soap and being thorough. Uh, and then finally, there, there are other things that are just sort of really common sense. If you're very ill and you have diarrhea, fevers, jaundice, or vomiting, you want to make sure that you're not doing something where you're touching produce and that goes for your workers too. And um, if you've cut yourself, you know, throw out any produce that's come in contact with blood so that you're not passing on bloodborne pathogens and then bandage the cuts and wear gloves over the bandage. 
Uh, so um, it looks like we're running out of time, and I want to make sure that Hans has time to talk about his uh, stuff on, on farm to schools and farm to institutions. So just basically, if you have visitors coming onto your farm, you want to let them know about the importance of washing their hands, particularly before and after they're touching your livestock or, and before they're handling your produce. So have hand washing stations available and uh, signage for visitors. And then this is, um, I'm not going to go over this in any detail, but it's just an example of how you can think about some of the costs that might be associated with food safety and spread them out over time. Think about having you know, a, a five or ten year plan for any investments. So if you look at this one on the bottom line, you might start out with just having a pickup truck and you wash it and clean it on a regular basis. And then maybe after you've accumulated some more capital to invest in your business, then and you might think about getting a power washer to make it easier to clean your truck and your harvesting containers. And then finally, you know, maybe someday really down the line when you get really big, you might want to think about having a re refrigerated truck if you're hauling um, your food long distances. Okay, Hans, it's all yours. Okay, great. I'm not going to spend much time here at all. Let's see, we're, yeah, we're about out of time anyway. Um, but uh, if you're considering um, selling to institutions, just uh, check the box there. I'm wondering if there's anyone out there um, that is considering it now. Any green checks? Okay, then I'll even be shorter. Um, <laughs> there, the reason I didn't matter, we put them all to sleep. <laughs> yeah, the reason you might want to consider it is that um, you know, if, if you're thinking about trying to have have more people in your community eat food, and especially underserved populations, this is a great way uh, is to sell food and make relationships with um, institutional cooks or food service managers. And um, and thanks, Jesse. Flexibility on time. I see that I still won't go very far <laughs> or long. <laughs> and um, the other point is that. Uh, I think that building, and if we're trying to build capacity of local food systems, community food systems, being able to kind of ramp up that capacity, um, uh, selling to institutions and sort of ramp up the uniformity is going to really go a long way to uh, bolstering local food economies. And I've worked down here in Wyndham County um, with the Wyndham Farm Food Network, and we're, we're getting going, um, connecting about over about a dozen farmers to 30, 40 institutions. So we're learning as we go. Uh, one thing, I've, I've definitely learned a couple things about institutions. So just real, real quickly, I really encourage people to make relationships with institutions and with the, with the uh, cooks there. Um, and just a couple things. Uh, the definitely that food service in general, they're really trained uh, to minimize contamination. Uh, they know everything about hand washing, the 20 second rule. They put up those signs about washing for 20 seconds uh, a decade or more ago in their bathrooms. Uh, they know about sterilizing stuff. They have specifications. Cold chain is a word they're really familiar with. So just being able to talk their language, basically, be on the same wavelength is really, really key. Uh, and briefly, hospitals and senior centers other institutions that are really key to, to get involved with also have sort of a heightened concern about the compromised immune systems that are within their eaters and they have greater risk so they can't have they have to have pasteurized eggs and other other things that uh, schools would not have um, okay so a couple couple more things Cafeteria cooks, unlike, say, a buyer um, in a, a retail um, supermarket, they're under a lot of pressure, time pressure, to get food out at a certain time. Um, they have a certain number of staff who is used to doing things a certain way. So having sort of a clean, uniform product is really key. The, the, if you're looking at, say, apples, like the size of the apple, how long it's going to take it to process, to process it, is the number, the count that they have, all of those are really important concerns. So um, you know, the more you can kind of um, think about uniformity and what it's like to process these things and sort of advertise that, the better you'll do. 
And in hindsight, you know, I'm, I'm again, as you get into this, there are a lot of specifics. I'd be really happy to to work with any farmer uh, about building those relationships. But in hindsight, the the really um, in, the incredible added value is this relationship that develops between farmers and the cooks and the trusted trusted relationship. They start talking to people. I've had a few um, cooks down here, institutional cooks, who have told me point blank without a survey or anything that their jobs have gotten a lot more interesting since they started working with farms. And um, you know, likewise that that farmers knowing that their products are going out to you know all these school children and are being served up at snack time um, is is a really important thing, uh, and that you can think of all of, all of that networking as sort of building social capital within a community that that um, helps communities be more resilient. So again, I, I, I couldn't encourage any farmer more to, you know, I just couldn't encourage you more to go and try to reach out to any institutions in your area and just go knock on their door and say, look, I'm here. This is what I could offer and, um, at, you know, at this price and um, start talking to them because uh, I don't think you'll regret it. And I think I will end it right there. Ginger? Uh, Ginger doesn't see. Ginger, are you there? Or did you just leave? No, thank you, Hans. I turned off my uh, okay. my microphone while you were speaking. Yeah. So basically, I was just saying I'm not going to go yeah. over this slide because we've already talked about all of these issues. It's just reiterating them. Um, Hans, do you want to talk at all about the practical food safety day long workshops? That you're going to be sure, offering. I'll mention. I'll mention this. I'm. I'm really excited about these coming up, and there may be more than two. Uh, but it's it's basically the day will be spent uh, in process as a as a working workshop to actually write this food safety plan. And I've already worked with three farms, um, three mostly um, direct market farmers in Wyndham area and Rutland, uh, doing this, and it's been a very uh, good fruitful process and they've come up with say one to two, more like two page farm plans that are real easy to read and very clear, kind of the door roadmap uh, version that they could easily, you know, put on their websites or hand to, you know, prospective buyers if they have questions about what they do um, and have in their in their sort of farm plan document. So uh, that's that's really what it is. We'll be starting out and just uh, you know there'll be a template for um, writing under different prompts and evaluating yourself and putting any things you want to change. Uh, and then you'll be able to view these templates that have already been written from other farms and choose ones. Often copy wholesale things that other people have been written written and paste them in and tweak them a little and come up some come up with something by the end that you're really comfortable with. Uh, as representing sort of your practice, and so good good opportunity to learn, and we'll have these sort of tangential forays into this, some of the science behind some of the stuff, or where some of these prompts have come from. And all of the prompts are really rooted in GAP uh, certification. They come from what GAP is also, um, you know, focused on. The the difference is they really are practical. A lot of times we'll, we'll think about you know what is practical for your farm and what wouldn't you do that GAP would do um, or would require you to do. So Hans, are the dates for that March 3rd in Brattleboro and March 9th in Berlin? Uh, that is almost correct. I think, hold on, I'm looking at my calendar. March 3rd in Brattleboro and March 10th, Thursday ah. in Berlin. And you can uh, go to the Fruit and Berry website um, I don't know if Jesse you could pull that up for Gribbinger's website in the inf the information and the uh, application is uh, online there and it's really just a sign up um, at this point. The cost is twenty dollars for the day, which includes everything and a lunch um, and a loan computer if you need it. Okay, great, thanks. And um, I would also recommend if, if you're interested, um, there's a lot of other resources out there. There are a number of great 
websites um, that have lots of information about food safety. Even if you're not um, interested in becoming GAP certified, you can still learn about sort of the whys and wherefores behind these practices. The National um, GAP uh, organization is is housed at Cornell, and they have some really wonderful materials. If you want to learn about anything more in detail, please feel free to contact me. And um, I am at Jean Nickers at uvm.edu. Hans is H Estrin at uvm.edu, and Londa. I'm sorry, Londa, I don't have your email in here. Maybe Londa's not with us anymore. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Londa. <laughs> so, um, so I saw. I'm going to go back. I saw a question from Gretchen. Gretchen, are you still with us? Well, Gretchen was asking if a producer had high E. coli counts after water testing, but document that they're using other methods to um, reduce the risk of contamination, such as using drip irrigation, does that affect their compliance with a GAPS audit? And can they still pass that section of the audit? And the, the answer is is yes. I mean that a lot of this is really about is the farmer assess aware of what the risks are, are they assessing the risks, and are they taking steps to mitigate it. And um, at, at this point, if the farmer is taking steps to mitigate um, any risks associated with their irrigation water, they can still pass, pass a GAPS audit if they have um, Higher total coliform in, in the fact, E. coli I'll add levels. Too, I know Steve has often mentioned that the, he is the state auditor that there actually are not uh, clear standards for irrigation water quality. That that Vermont standard, a recreational standard of 277, mentioned earlier, um, is if you're over that, it actually you don't fail or not get points for a certain thing. You just want to be paying attention to and trying to address the risks. Uh, as, as on the farm. Yeah, so it's really it's really about for irrigation water. It's really about mitigation. Are you aware of the issue, and are you trying to minimize it as much as possible? Um, and then, Jesse, you had asked about standard sanitation practices for harvesting containers and tools, and alternatives to chlorine. Um, you know the the. Sanitation practices for harvesting containers and tools. I don't know, Hans. What what would you say about that from a practical food safety perspective? Uh, I don't want to get people off on a gap tangent. Well, well, first of all, that that drying is a great sanitation practice, and um, I'm I'm not all that aware of a lot of studies, but I certainly know E. coli and cold viruses, um, if they're dried for, they're, all of those are, are fairly fragile, and if they're just dried for a certain amount of time, they are not going to be virulent anymore. Um, how much time, that's, that remains uh, unknown as far as I'm concerned, but you know, drying your dishes is really important, um, if, especially if you're not using soap. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest practical um, thing and storing stuff where it's undercover and isn't going to get um, isn't going to get pooped on by birds or um, have a lot of dust fall on it, uh, etc. Uh, peroxide's the number one disinfectant that I think organic growers are using, as far as I know. And correct me if I'm wrong, Virginia. Um, and uh, I guess. Like that, you know, I think that's what I, those are the two main things that I would say. But, but just cleaning things and drying them is, is a very good practice. Yeah, and a lot of this is really common sense. I mean, if, you're, if, if it looks like your harvesting container needs to be cleaned, it probably needs to be cleaned. So any other questions that folks have? All right. Whoops. Londa, is there? Oh. <laughs> Does Londa have anything to add? Londa, I can turn on your mic if you want to uh, click on the bottom left-hand corner if you wanted to add anything. 
um, bottom left hand corner picture of the mic, you'll see that there. Okay. I think am I am I on? You are. You are. Okay, good. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um yeah, they did a very good job. And I just wanted to mention I started typing it in, but um there is like work being done in, in various places across the US to try to um find some like alternatives for wash water for um disinfecting wash water. Um for, you know, having some organic alternatives to chlorine. But but those efforts are still pretty in the develop in the beginning stages. So uh, you know, so eventually we should have more information on that. But as I and as I typed in the box, um, if you have questions on um, like processed foods, of the safety of processed foods, or of uh, meat or maple, those those areas, you can uh, feel free to ask me, and, and I'll um, do the best I can to to help you with that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and UV, um, I wasn't thinking uh, about UV when I was talking, but UV filtration of any kinds of liquids or, or you know, water, uh, well water that doesn't pass inspection or cider, uh, there are a lot of UV filters that can disinfect things. All right, well, I want to thank um, Hans and Ginger for being with us today, and thanks all of you for joining us. Um, and this has been a great presentation. Londa, thanks for chiming in there, too. We've got a lot of great resources here um, at UVM. And if you want any more information, please be in touch with one of us. Also, you can always go to the uh, UVM Extension New Farmer website. Um, this webinar will be on the website uh, in about a week, probably, uh, under recorded webinars. We'll also post a PDF of this presentation. And uh, hopefully, um, that will be helpful to all of you. So thanks a lot, guys. It was great to have you with us today. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Jesse.